So we are in the book of Romans this morning, Romans chapter 6, if you have your Bibles. Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 are three of the most pivotal chapters in the New Testament in understanding how to live the Christian life, to know what the Christian life is and how to live it. And so uh, let's pray and ask God to give us wisdom. We're just going to go through a little bit of it today. And, uh, but it's really important that we all understand what Paul is teaching here and how we can have victory over sin in our lives. So let's pray. Father, we're thankful for what's written here. You've given it to us that we might not uh, be ignorant, that we might understand the gospel, and that we might understand what is our inheritance as a result of what you have done for us, Jesus, uh, that we have the power to overcome sin in our lives now where we didn't have that when we were unsaved and lost. Now that you dwell in us and your Holy Spirit is in us, you've given us uh, everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. You've created in us a desire to pursue you and to obey you and to follow you and to not walk away from you anymore. And so, Lord, I pray that we would understand these things and you would show us by your Holy Spirit the power that's in us. And if uh, we're understanding that and experiencing that on a daily basis, we praise you for it. It's your grace. If there's those uh, who are here Christians and are still stuck in the mire of this sin and, uh, you know, just the impossibility of overcoming it, uh, that you would open our eyes to see today they don't have to live that way. They're free from it because of what you've done. And uh, Lord, uh, also there could be this issue that we haven't really been saved yet. If we're still living in a sinful pattern, a sinful way of life, a desire to sin habitually, then there's uh, evidence that we're not truly born again. So again, God, give us all insight that we might know where we stand and where we are with you and that you would be glorified, Jesus. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. So we're starting with... Uh, Chapter 6, uh, I'm going to read a few verses up to verse 11. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin, now, if we died with Christ, we believe we should also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord." So Paul's teaching us here that this principle of sin that was so easy to live by uh, the majority of our lives before we came to know Jesus Christ is now broken. The power that once compelled us to sin and to do nothing but sin has been broken. We're free from it. We don't have to be slaves to sin anymore. Now, if we're Christians, that's good news, right? If we're not Christians, we don't want to be free from sin because we like our sin. We love our sin. We want to stay on our sin. And that's the difference between someone who knows God and someone who doesn't know God. Someone who truly knows God doesn't want to sin anymore. Even though we still sin occasionally, we have a desire to not sin anymore. We don't like sin. We hate what it does to people's lives. Uh, we, we hate the anxiety and the lack of peace it, it creates in, in the human heart. We, we don't like what it does in relationships. We, we don't like what it does in the world to people and nations and countries and uh, people like Hamas or whatever. Uh, sin destroys human life. 
Sin causes us all to have to die physically. Sin breaks the heart of the lost person. And how long does it take before someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ puts up with this uh, terrible addiction to sin? And sin manifests itself in many different ways. Uh, You might have a a secret sin that you committed habitually before you became a Christian. And you can remember the days that you spent in that sin. It could have been drunkenness. It could have been drug addiction. It could have been sexual immorality, pornography. It could have been uh, greed or thieving or stealing or robbing or lying or uh, just a host of things that you've done. Hating, being unforgiving, just the bitterness that's in the human heart because of sin. Those are all attributes of people that need a Savior. If you're living in any of those kind of ways, it's evidence that you need Jesus. You might not think you do, but you do. And the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. Everybody's going to die because of human sin, and because of our sin against God. But the good news is the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the benefit of having Jesus, one of the many benefits is that if you know him and you're saved, you're going to have a tremendous life that goes beyond this grave. You're going to live in heaven with no more sin and no more sickness and no more disease and no more death, no more war, no more hatred, no more temptation. You're going to be with the Lord and his people for all eternity, never to have to even think about sin again. But if you don't have Jesus and you die and you leave this world without a savior, you will spend eternity in hell forever and ever. Suffering, torment, punishment, no way out. Forever and ever and ever. Hell forever and ever and ever. That's horrific. And you don't have to go to hell. Even though many times people tell you to go to hell, you don't have to go to hell. You have an option. But the option only can come to you as if God's calling you to himself. You can sit here and say, well, that makes sense. What do I have to do? Well, you need to call upon Jesus and ask him to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Only he can save you. Church can't save you. No human being can save you. Only Jesus can save you. And every one of us that have come to faith in Jesus Christ had to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. At the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow one day and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's all about Jesus and your need of him. So Paul is teaching in this chapter this issue of people at the time were thinking, well, Jesus died for all my sins, and because he died for all my sins and I'm saved by grace, I can keep sinning because I'm still forgiven. That's a twisted kind of thinking, but that's how people were sort of trying to resolve the conflict of the fact that they still had a proclivity or a desire or a temptation to commit sin. When you first get saved, you're so excited because the burden of sin is taken off of you and you know you're forgiven. And, 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 and life is completely different whenever you first get saved. You want to follow the Lord. You want to be close to him. You don't want to sin for sure. You, it's so fresh what he's delivered you from. And, and, and knowing what you used to do and how you used to live and that you're not needing or wanting to live that way anymore. So you attend church. You, you read your Bible. You pray. You fellowship. You, you memorize scripture. You're reading devotions. You're just immersed 
in the Word and the things of God. You're not interested in shady movies anymore. You're not interested in certain kind of music anymore. You're, you're not interested in abusing alcohol or taking drugs or you're not interested in being immoral. You, all these things, God's giving you a new heart and he's giving you uh, a, a new desire in life. Then what happens after a while is that the newness has a tendency to get not as new. And you can begin to slip a little bit. You can begin to go backwards a little bit. And the reason that happens is, is that God is so merciful in the beginning. He, get, he just pours out grace, pours out grace, pours out grace. Gives you teaching, gives you understanding, gives you light to understand how to live the Christian life. And he gives you verses like, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a man or some it are. But exhort each other. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, being with believers, right? Then all of a sudden, one Sunday you get up, I don't feel like going to church today. Has that ever happened to anybody? I can skip one Sunday. It's not going to be a problem, you know? And then all of a sudden, it's easy to skip two Sundays. And then three Sundays. And then four Sundays. Believe me, I know. I've been there. I've done it. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, I wonder why I'm not as zealous or focus on my relationship with the Lord. I have a lot of other things to crawl in there. Going to the beach when we lived in Philadelphia, it was more fun going to the beach and listening to some boring sermon on a Sunday until I found Pastor Joe, and then it was fun. I enjoyed Calvary Philly. But, you know, it, it was, you know, this desire to sort of do your own thing. There's nothing wrong with vacations and going away and that, that kind of stuff. Don't get me wrong. But if the, the tendency is laziness or apathy or complacency, then it's going to affect your, your zeal for the Lord, your strength to be strong in the Lord. All of a sudden, temptations are going to come and you're going to find yourself falling victim to them because you, you, you've, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. You're, you're just allowing yourself to just be, you know, uh, lazy. And so what happens is you begin to maybe go back to some of the things you used to do. And you can't believe you're doing that, but you are. And then some people that know you might find out, and they say, I thought you became a Christian. Oh, yeah, I am. Well, why are you doing what you used to not do? Why are you doing that again or whatever? And what, what kind of excuse do you have? And Paul, when he was preaching, if you read his epistles, there was so many teachings on correction, getting right with God, repenting, um, studying the word, praying without ceasing, the command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. All these things Paul was constantly focusing and driving home to the churches because the churches fell into all kinds of problems. They fell into immorality. They fell into um, anger and, and division and backbiting and slander and, and the, the people were ugly. Uh, the Christians became ugly and became uh, acting like unbelievers at times. So, so Paul had to lay down certain principles in his teaching apostolically that the Lord had given him so that we can understand the big picture. And so he says, the question was, well, in verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's what they were asking. And Paul made it very clear, certainly not, explanation point. He doesn't make any excuses for sin anymore. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So when Jesus died on the cross, he broke the curse and the power of sin. When he said it's finished, he completed the work that he was sent to do to atone for the sins of the, of the, of the, of the elect, of those who would believe in him. And so he died, he shed his blood, and he forgave us. But not only did he forgive us, he broke that curse and that power that was in us to, to have to sin or to want to sin. He, he, he completely eradicated it. And so in other words, when he died for your sins, he not only died for your sins, but he died to the power of sin in your life. So all of us have been given the privilege of, of living a life where we don't have to sin. 
So he asks the question, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Someone gave the illustration of a, a person who owned a house next door to them. The person that lived in that house before never cut the grass. The house needed painted. There was junk all over the front yard. It was a complete mess. And it was just like an old, old house that just looked like an old, old building that was going to fall down. And the people that lived in the house were just out of it. You know, they just weren't participating in life. They were they were dead spiritually and physically, emo not physically, emotionally, mentally. That's how they looked at life. They, they lived as though they were dead. Finally, they sold the house. The new people that moved in all of a sudden started cutting the grass, replanting the lawn, painting the outside, making it look nice. And all of a sudden, the house next door wasn't the same house anymore. And the people that used to live in there that made it a mess moved out. They're no longer there. And there's new people in the house now that aren't living the way the old people live. And that's sort of like our lives. Before Jesus came into our life, we were like the old house. Everything we were doing was despicable and ugly and not healthy and, 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 and repulsive. If people actually knew you the way you knew yourself, no one would want to be around you as an unbeliever. They wouldn't be comfortable about it. When Jesus came to save you and you received him as your Lord and Savior, he came to live inside of you and basically threw everything out that was in there before that wasn't supposed to be there now. He cleaned house and he continually cleans house. He continually cleanses us and sanctifies us and purifies us and, and makes us holy as he's holy. This is his will to make us more and more like him every day. So Paul's asking you and me and anybody that's reading this at the time, if, if, you, if, you, if that power of sin died in you, why are you still living like it's alive in you? It's, it's not right. This was completely dealt with when Jesus died on the cross. It wasn't just like, forgiving me so I can go to heaven. That's, that's a nice thing. But working on my life so I don't have to destroy my life on a daily basis by living a sinful life. So he gives the illustration of this baptism in verse 3. Do you not know that as many of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So this spiritual connection to what happens in physical baptism. Baptism doesn't save us, but it shows the picture of what Christ did for us. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that he was then buried, and then he rose again the third day. So there's the death, the burial, and the resurrection. In baptism, and many of you have been baptized whether it's been here or somewhere else, you were buried, you were immersed in the water. The early church emerged, total immersion in, in baptism, uh, representing that the old life goes into the water, is dying, the picture of Christ dying for us, dying for our sin. We're buried in the waters of baptism. We're brought out, representing the resurrection and newness of life. And this is the picture that he's drawing here for us. As many as us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through the baptism into, into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should all walk in newness of life. And I always love it when we do the baptism because when the people come out, they're smiling ear to ear. They're like, Wow, this is awesome. I don't know what they're feeling or what's going on, but I know God's blessing them because, you know, he tells us to be baptized and, and uh, it's a blessing. It's a sign of obedience and, and following him. First thing that happens after you become a Christian, you should be baptized. So they come out and, and they're, they're so aware, of course, they're taught too, that this represents the newness of life that they walk now. They're not walking the old way anymore. They're walking in a new way. 
And it tells us in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man or woman is in Christ, they are a new creation, right? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So your friends say, well, why don't you do this anymore? Why don't you do that anymore? Well, I got a new life. I have a new desire. I'm not like judging you or putting you down, but I'm not going that way anymore. I used to be going that way, and I was on the highway to hell, and I didn't want to repent, and I wanted to do my sin. The Holy Spirit convicted me. Christ called me to himself and broke me and humbled me, and he turned me around spiritually and physically. And now he has me going on that road that's narrow that leads to life, and, and, and that's where I'm staying on by his grace to the day I leave this life walking in newness of life. And that's the whole evidence of, of what salvation does. It takes us from going this way, the way towards hell, and it takes us to go the way toward the Lord and blessing and pleasing him. Now, if I'm on this way and I say, well, I prayed, I asked Jesus to save me, come into my heart and all this stuff, and you have not turned, you have not repented, there's no evidence that God turned you around to go in a different direction, I don't care what you say you prayed or what you believe, you still are lost. And the good news is if you're still lost, you can still be saved. You can say, God, there's something wrong here. I believed all the right things, but I'm living all the wrong ways. And I need you to do for me what I can't do for myself. And that's save my soul. You cannot save yourself. You can't save yourself by some prayer. The prayer isn't what saves you. It's the Lord that saves you. You know? They, they ask Paul, well, what, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So, so Paul's dealing with this. And this, this gets deeper as we go into Romans 7 because he's talking about in that chapter, we'll get there, why do I do the things I don't want to do and the things I know I should do, I don't do? There's this principle working in, in me that causes me to fail. And he's, he's talking out loud and he's talking by experience and he's talking about what is the power that causes us to not have to sin anymore? He, 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 you can read that chapter. Read ahead. We'll get there um, in a couple, probably another three weeks or so, or four weeks. But he says, I got this thing going on in me. What I know I should do, I don't do. And what I, I, I shouldn't do, I do. And what's going on? And he comes to this conclusion. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Wake up! <laughs> Some of you guys are sleeping. <laughs> but seriously, this, this is like, this is, this is big. I mean, not me and what I'm saying. This Bible, these verses are big. They can change your life. You know, your wife's not getting up in the middle of the night and saying, my God, why are you on that pornography again? And some of you guys have had that conversation. If not you, some friend you know that's a Christian. Why are you doing that? You said you wouldn't do it anymore. You said you're going to pray and ask, well, I don't know, honey, I can't help it. I just got to keep doing this. Or maybe it's some other thing, the bottle under the bed or the marijuana here. Or whatever. I don't know what your deal is, but I just know that when Paul dealt with a church, it was many times a cesspool. It was. And we all look holy and just and righteous here today, but if God turned us all inside out, man, what would, what would we see here? You might be sitting beside someone. I'm not sitting beside you. I'm going over here, you know. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I love what he says. Oh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Christ can deliver you from whatever it is that's haunting you, holding you victim, holding you captive, destroying your life, destroying your kids, destroying your marriage. There is no excuse if you're a believer. Christ can deal with it all, and he can take it away. You can say, Lord, I don't want to have this desire anymore. Please take it away. Guess what he does? He takes it away. 
He has the power to take it away. So this, this whole thing's going on here in, in Paul's teaching. The principles are over and over and over again because he, he wants to drive this home so it finally um, changes the life. Because a lot of the stuff in the Christian life is between your two temples. If you aren't grounded and you're not thinking clearly about what the Bible teaches, it's not going to have any power in your life. You have to know what the truth is. And Jesus says, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. It does. There's nothing better than being free in Christ. No amount of money, no materialism, no accomplishment can come close to, to what it means to be free in your life from sin. Now, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And if someone says they don't sin anymore, they're lying. But there's this life going on in us that we're sinning less, right? If there was a, a little machine we could have and we could test each other's degree of sin today versus what it was like 10 years ago or five years ago, or maybe a year ago, it, what's encouraging is that the Holy Spirit's working that we are sinning less. But none of us can complain, uh, can uh, say we're, we're sinless, right? But we're sinning less. And so Paul talks about this absolute necessity for the work of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So that's what he's saying to you and me today. Folks, you're on here listening. Clark's listening too. I don't want you to be unwise. I want you to understand what the will of the Lord is. No confusion here. Crystal clarity for all of us. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. He didn't say, don't drink wine. He says, don't be drunk with wine. There's a big difference, isn't there? Those of you who like wine, you have a glass of wine, that, that's fine. You end up having two, I guarantee you got a buzz, and you're drunk. You ever see the sign, buzz drinking is drunk driving? <laughs> the signs tell us, right? And that's a conversation you and the Lord have. To. I'm not going to tell you, you know how you handle that personally. You just got to do what God wants you to do. But he uses an illustration because the people that were reading this knew what it was like to be drunk. And most of us do too. He says, but be filled with the Spirit. Not filled with anything other than the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you're sp filled with the Spirit, you'll speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting one another to the fear of God. So the first thing we need to have victory over sin is the power of the Holy Spirit working in our life. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, we will be committing sin. If you're being controlled by the dictates of uh, what the Bible calls it the flesh, it isn't this body that's evil, it's, it's th this, uh, this fallen part of humanity that will be in us until we die that Jesus said he, he put to death and it, it shouldn't be resurrecting itself, empowering itself to live its uh, selfish uh, ways. But th this is what Paul says regarding uh, this issue of um, the Spirit. In Galatians 5.16. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So in other words, if you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be wanting to sin, right? And you won't be sinning when you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. 
You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You can underline that in your Bible. You, you, it's just impossible. For the flesh, and this is where the battle is, and this is what Paul talks about in the seventh chapter of Romans. The flesh, this fallen nature that still tries to act like it's in charge, lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and they're contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. When Paul says, why do I do what I don't want to do? And why... Uh, don't I do what I know I should do? That's this battle of the flesh and the spirit. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. In other words, when we're walking with the power of God and the Holy Spirit's controlling us, we don't have to be told all these laws and rules of, 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 of godly living. They're just automatic because Christ is in us and we're walking in his power and in his life. I don't have to look at a list and say, was well, that still a sin to lust? It's going to be a sin until the day you die and we're told not to lust. So the works of the flesh or the works of the fallen nature are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, that's drug abuse, hatred, contentions. Now, so the first ones are like, well, I don't, adultery, fornication, that's off the table, right? But like get down into this area. Uh, contentions, arguments, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. Husbands, you ever get mad at your wife and slam the door and yell at her and say things you wish you shouldn't have said or wives, you do the same. You ever do that to your husband? You just get really upset with him. You, you walk away and you say something and you, you say, well, I can't believe I, I acted that way. Well, that's the, the flesh. That's the fallen nature. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, but it's partying, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past. And so Paul, he had to be repetitive. He told him about these things before, he said in the past, and then tell him again, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when Paul says, should we continue in sin that grace may abound, God forbid if we did continue in sin the way we did before grace impacted our life, where would we be? On the highway to hell, right? We won't inherit the kingdom of God. So if any of these things are, are principles in your life, and I'm not saying you can't slip up, you can't make a mistake, and you ask the Lord to forgive you, and he does, and, and he, you, know, you, you're, you haven't lost your salvation. You no, know, that is not what this is about. But the propensity, the desire of your life is every day I want to keep doing these things that I'm told not to do here. It's evidence that you're not a Christian. And you won't inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, if we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, it's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Isn't that the kind of life you want to have? Do you guys like that kind of life? Or do you want the other kind of life? That's what I want. I want more of that. I like having peace in my life. And I don't like it when I don't have peace in my life. I want peace in my home. I know Cindy does too. And we have to endeavor to walk in the Spirit every day. And we know when we're in the flesh. It's obvious. It's nice to have a single family dwelling because when you're yelling, usually only you and your wife hear it. <laughs> you live in a patio home or a townhouse or condo. I thought those people were Christians over there. You hear what they're saying to each other? <laughs> but it's so cool though, whenever the Lord's in us, he convicts us. That was wrong, Clark, in how you addressed your wife or to Cindy, that was wrong. And, and we, we ask for forgiveness. We pray together. We, we keep short accounts together so that we can have this peace in our home and that we honor the Lord. It says those, in verse 24, who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So when Paul's teaching us in Romans 6, that we're dead to sin, 
the, reason, the, the, the reality of experiencing this deadness of sin comes by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's real. And it's ours. It's part of our inheritance and what Christ has given us. We're commanded to walk in the Spirit. We're commanded to not walk in the flesh. We're commanded, again, to walk in the Spirit. You used to practice sin in your life. And now you're practicing godly living. Jesus talks about the heart. And he sees our hearts. He looks at the heart. If you turn to Matthew for a minute. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 16. Beware of false prophets, verse 15, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. So you guys, we, we all know each other in here pretty good. And so we, can, we know, first of all, we're Christians by the fruit that's in our lives, right? There's evidence that we follow Jesus. We love Jesus. Um, someone comes here, and they're a little bit out, outside the box, so to speak, and we have a conversation with them, and it's F this or that or, you know, complaining or, you know, cursing or, you know, you just know they're still lost. And, man, I'm glad they come here. Come, bring them in, Lord, you know, so they can hear the gospel like, like we behaved at one time. But you can, you can know by the evidence that someone doesn't know the Lord, Right? Gary tells me all the time, he talks to people out in the concrete industry. He's always sharing the Lord with them. Why would he do that? Because he knows they need the Lord. They need to know the message. Because the fruit shows that they don't know him. And if they die without him, they'll be in hell. The fruit and the evidence. Back to Ephesians. It's all tied together with this um, Romans 6. Ephesians 5, verse 5 through 8. He said, well, let's look at three. He says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, that's greediness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting. So you're out on the job site or you're somewhere with friends and next thing you know, the dirty jokes start coming, you know, the, the stuff that isn't really cool to listen to. And one of two things, you're going to stand there and, ah, that's funny, you know, and pretend like, you know, it doesn't, it's not a big deal. Or you're going to excuse yourself and just move away from it. Not going to participate in it. He said, those things aren't fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So again, you know, and he's writing this book to Christians in Ephesus. Why would he need to tell them this? Because within the audience, there's always people that think they're saved, but really aren't saved yet. And so it's like a wake-up call again. Hey, something's wrong, you know? Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, don't be partakers with them. For you once were darkness, verse 8, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is a shame even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, 
For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep. That's why I was waking you. <laughs> Forgive me. It says, awake you who sleep. And don't feel bad. I've, I've slept in pastor's conferences, so they have to yell at me too, you know. <laughs> It's just really easy. The Sandman, the devil comes around. Yeah, I'm not going to let you hear this. Just nod off for five minutes so you can keep doing what you're doing. Hey, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. And then the last verse I want to read before we take communion is over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I love this one. Okay, this is in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals. How about that nowadays? That's like a taboo subject, isn't it? It's okay. Like, it's hard to believe how many churches are embracing and endorsing this sin and saying it's okay, where the Bible clearly says it isn't okay. And, and don't be proud if you're, you're thinking about homosexuality and you're fornicating everywhere. You're just as in bad shape. One isn't any worse than the other. What's that? Oh, yeah. I thought someone disagreed. I was going to say, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, that'll happen one of these days, I'm sure. So it says, you, don't you know about this stuff? And I've read this for like four different parts of the Bible, the same message, okay? Um, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And I love this verse. And such were some of you. Stand up if it was some of you. Stand up just for a minute. Stand up. I'm already standing up. Such were some of you. Such are some of you. Such are some of you. Such are some of you. The only person who isn't standing up is Margie. She just had knee replacement surgery. <laughs> hip, well, you know, she's, she's standing up there, hip replacement. Is anybody sitting here? <laughs> no. Okay, such are some of you. You may be seated. Give yourself a, an applause <laughs> of, 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 of admitting, admitting your flaw. Such are some of you, but you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. Amen? He changes our lives. And that's the purpose of the gospel, that lives can be changed as the worship team comes forward. You know what's wonderful? Every time I take the Lord's Supper... And there's been times where I've maybe carried an attitude in my heart about someone or something, a bitterness and unforgiveness that needs to go. I can't take the supper if I got something in my heart that isn't right before the Lord. And I always ask the Lord to review my heart when we have this time of the supper, that if there's anything amiss and anything isn't right, that it, it, it's made right before him. And sometimes it might be like, Lord, I know I need to forgive this person or whatever, and I ask you to give me grace to forgive them. Help me to forgive them. I understand that my unforgiveness is sin. I don't call it anything else but sin. Please forgive me. And he does. It tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, and that means agree with God about what he says about him, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I can take the supper today, and you can too, by giving over to the Lord what it is you want him to change in your heart and take away. And thank him that he's faithful to do that and just. If you're here today and you think you're a Christian but you want to stay in your sin, you know, don't take the supper. The Bible says you will bring judgment upon yourself. And no one's looking around to see who's taking it or who isn't taking it. Don't worry about that. There's been times where I've sat where you sat and I've let the supper go by because I wasn't ready to deal with what it was I needed to deal with in my heart. 
But it's a celebration of God's goodness and what he can do and what he does do for us when we come clean with him in our hearts. He's the one that works to cause us to repent. He's the one that desires us to turn away from our sin. And it's all about him. It's all about what he does and his will and his power and his might and his ability. It's not about anything regarding what you think you can do to change anything. It's all through his grace and through his power. And Jesus himself spoke in Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The time is at hand right now. The day is a day of salvation. If your heart is beating harder and you know it to be true, that's the voice of God calling to your soul to come and believe on Jesus Christ. If you feel nothing, then nothing's happening. And I'm not saying going by feeling, but if there's no conviction, there's no like desperation, then um, another Sunday perhaps. So let's just take a moment before we take the supper to allow the Lord to speak to our hearts. And if it's about Jesus becoming your Savior, then let him save you. Get out of the way and just have him do what only he can do for you. If it's as a Christian, you've been slipping, sliding away, ask him to draw you back to where you need to be. If you're walking with the Lord faithfully, thank him and praise him for how good he's been to you. And don't take any credit for it because it's completely him, his grace in your life. Father, we're so grateful to you. We're so thankful as men who are called to come and preach, teach here in this church that we don't come with our own philosophies, our own agendas, our own ideas. We come with what your word says and we just put it out there as you've written it and all of us have to deal with it. And we're so thankful, Lord, that as Christians, we willingly want to deal with whatever it is you have to give us that we might become more like Jesus. And we thank you for the conviction. We thank you for the correction. We thank you for your patience with us and your grace. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that is fighting you, Lord, they can't win. You'll conquer them in your time. Bring them to yourself and save them as only you can, Lord. And if there's any, Lord, who are here that have been confused because they haven't understood the truth that you've given them power over sin, show them this week as they begin to reckon, the Bible says, to declare, to believe as true that they no longer have to sin. They no longer have to be trapped as a Christian. Show them this week that freedom, Lord. And the night that Jesus is betrayed, he took the bread in his hands and he broke it and he gave thanks and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you or given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same manner on an evening, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins of many. Drink this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we show forth the Lord's death till he comes again. Amen. God bless you guys. I, I hope I didn't wake anybody up out of your nap. You can sleep this afternoon as long as you want until your wife tells you to get up. God bless you guys.
Love you.